Next up to learn from, we have Rosemary. She's the senior project manager at product manager at Atlassian. She's talking about the best practices and anti patterns in API product ownership and product management from her learning and perspective as a PO at very different organizations. So thank you so much, Rosemary. Hi. Thank you so much for the introduction. And hi, everyone. This is Rosemary here. Um, I work as a senior product manager with Atlassian here out of Melbourne. And uh, today I would like to share with you uh, some of the myths and anti-patterns that I have come across uh, working for various different um, industries back in um, Asia, um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, US and uh, EU as well. So um, throughout my career, I've come across various different, um, uh, you know, worked on various different products where sometimes APIs are, in, uh, are not like a part of your core thinking. And uh, uh, you'd see today in uh, uh, my talk where if you are stepping into the API world for the first time, then you're in the right place because today's talk is going to touch on all the learnings I've had, all what I've seen from my peers, learned from my peers um, as to you know what you should be thinking about when you're writing your first endpoint. So I would not be talking about um, experience if you're in that mature space, but if you're writing that first endpoint and first API, then you might find this insightful. So yeah, a little bit more about me. I've been working in engineering research um, and I've been teaching and then I worked in various different startups and uh, corporates as well. And um, kind of uh, uh, came in from that uh, software engineering design and uh, it fell into the product space. And the reason I tell you this is um, I've made mistakes myself um, in all these various different uh, roles that I've been in. And I've been working primarily in the FinTech space too and um, also in various other um, domains. And um, I've seen certain patterns as an engineer myself. And I've also seen certain patterns when I moved into the product space where we do not have the product mindset uh, when it comes to APIs. And so I think um, my talk today would actually touch on various different aspects. So you'll, I'll be talking about the product side, I'll be talking about the process side, and I'll also be talking about the design side. Now, let me jump in. The first one, the first anti-pattern, APIs are an afterthought. Uh, now, why would I say this? Most often, or a decade ago, we were all you know, operating in a very uh, traditional uh, business model type. So when I say traditional business model, what I'm trying to say is you've you know, focused on building certain capabilities, which are usually part of the application development process. So you only think of APIs as a solution there. Whereas this, this approach is very different to uh, companies like Stripe and Twilio, where they're creating and selling APIs. That's their uh, main source of revenue. So what happens when you are, uh, you know, working in a completely different business model is you're looking at, uh, you know, solving certain use cases. And that's when, um, you know, talks about, you know, should we solve this particular use case for an existing partner? What do we do? Do we have like an um, API solution there? Now, rethink when you get to that stage because you might want to think a little beyond and see, okay, I do have an existing relationship. You might want to build something there, but think of whether it can be some sort of um, partner API, which is like a hybrid between an internal and external API, which can also scale to other partners as well. When it comes to internal APIs, also think about, you know, maybe another team inside the company might want to, you might have an application where you probably will need to expose your data via an API. That's where internal APIs come. So the key part uh, or the key focus should be do not jump into a particular use case to solve it, but look at the bigger picture because when you start solving uh, a use case, you will be looking at APIs at a later stage. And you also got to ensure that when you are starting to rethink the strategy, right? you want to have an API enabled strategy, and that's when you are looking at this digital transformation, then factors to consider are data also. You, there might come a time where you'll want to monetize, right? So data is a big asset. So you've got to see, okay, is this something that I can uh, monetize at a later stage? It might come through APIs as well. So the key takeaway here is always think is 
that your APIs are your first class citizen. So to give you a very uh, quick uh, example, I worked on a monolith application. This is like a suite of, it contained like a suite of products. And um, the core product was also um, had its own APIs as well. And this is a massive monolith. So what happened is with one of the offshoot products, we started, you know, uh, solving certain use cases by adding more endpoints to the core product API. Now we had to rethink the whole strategy. Why? Problem is you're adding to this monolithic mess. So you'll have to start looking at decoupling it. Problem two, by adding extra endpoints, you're not thinking of the API as a product. You're thinking of API as a solution. And my next slide will talk about that. You're thinking of API as a solution, which is not good. So we had to go back, rethink the strategy, and then say, okay, we've got to somehow decouple it. We've got to break this monolith. And then you might want to consider each of these offshoots or you know the other uh, products as APIs themselves. Okay, so that's that's the kind of thinking you'll have to have uh, on day day one if you're uh, if you're like writing your first uh, endpoint for one of, for a new product. One to the next one. Next one is APIs are technical solutions. Now, just to draw on from what I spoke about previously, um, I did mention that we look at them as solutions. And why do we do this? Because um, you are trying to actually, as as product people, you are trying to get work done. You're trying to, you know, uh, focus on uh, building those strategic partnerships. And sometimes you might end up having um, APIs as just solving a particular use case. It's a solution which is coupled very tightly to an initiative, and it will probably rarely be used. So it's like shuttered for low adoption. To give you an example, I um, we one of the companies that I work for. We went into a partnership with a particular firm who had a global presence, and we were actually trying to step into a particular market. Um, and what happened is, in order to keep this uh, partnership going, we started, you know, building, uh, uh, adding endpoints and creating APIs for a uh, for one of the markets, which we already had a strong foundation. And where we were actually trying to uh, step in in this new market. We found that the party that we had uh, partnered with didn't actually have a firm footing. Their user base started dropping. And so what happened is these APIs that we built were really not uh, useful because uh, the intention was only building these partnerships and keeping those partnerships going with a long-term vision of having a global deal. So as much as I might say that it does open up new business channels, but you're also ending up writing a technical solution in the interim phase. So that's where you've got to look at the long term as well, as well as the short term. Okay. And keep in mind, they might come from the developer, which is why we say developer driven business needs, but they are not the only person. You're never going to build something just for one partner. You have to think as much as there might be custom ones but you might want to think how much you are going to be gaining out of it because it will eventually turn out to be a technical solution. Uh, the next one, API development cannot be agile. Now, this is often the case, uh, I've noticed with most of the teams that I've worked across, uh, you know, all, all parts of the world. Um, they start off with a very waterfall kind of an approach of getting requirements and then moving to the design and contract and dev, and then you go to the testing phase. It doesn't have to be that. When you are at the requirement stage, you can always be agile there. Get your developer partner vendor involved in these discussions so that you can build on those requirements, get those contracts you know, uh, defined together rather than go through every stage um, and then finally get that feedback. Okay, so you, what, what I'm trying to say is you need to have that API first uh, approach, but also keep in mind that you can always do this in a collaborative way, right? So, and, and uh, leverage off the different tools. You have like uh, open API, you know, those, those tools will help you to actually design those contracts, set up, you know, uh, channels of communication where you do not have to you, like have uh, someone set up a team meeting or anything like that have some quick and uh, cheap ways of communicating uh, when you are starting off, okay? And think of how you can actually combine uh, together and do that testing too. 
So all this can be done in a very um, iterative way because ultimately it is innovation de demands agility, right? So you've got to have that collective ownership and you as a team will not be able to do that alone. So you've got to get your developer involved much earlier. Okay, so that's, that's the reason to have that collaborative design as well. So that at a later stage, when you get past where you're, you delivered it and you've released it, they should be able to self-serve. So get them involved early on. Okay, this is an interesting one. AI and APIs are not complementary. Now, if you're starting for the first time, um, obviously AI will not be uh, on the top of your list. But today as AI is becoming a buzzword, there's something that you got to think about. Now, there might come, come a time where you might have like heaps of traffic, uh, there's a lot of API calls happening because you've like you've got a big huge uh, ecosystem, and you might want to think what do you want to do in terms of profiling. So if I talk about um, say um, usage monitoring, you will want to um, ensure that you are monitoring the traffic, but how much can you rely on uh, just the basic tools? You've got to start intelligently accessing. Uh, having access to different tools to see if you can find certain patterns. To give you an example, uh, when I worked in a compliance um, industry, we used to have like very stringent, very strict rules. And um, we used to profile these particular partners. They had to have like a tick off a set of security requirements. And once the partnership is signed off, all good, everything is done. And you know we know that these are the number of API calls per minute and all that. But say down the line after a year or two, you might notice something very different in the traffic, but is that uh, something that we need to be alarmed about? May not be, maybe there's a change in their business, maybe it's a genuine requirement and hence you see more API calls. So in our case, what happened is this it became completely manual where our whole team of you know uh, DX and the power, our marketing and sales, everybody got involved and they started manually processing and profiling the app as well as the usage to see what what is it that, what is the pattern that they were seeing? We could have automated it. We could have used AI for it. I've just given clustering as an example, but that sort of profiling will help you with monitoring of um, usage. When it comes to security testing, yes, there, there, are, there are heaps that you can, you can do, right? You have like a DDoS attack, which you'll probably use um, CDNs, you have BOAS, you have OWASP, you have session management, IAM, and the list goes on, but maybe use tools like Thing Intelligence, all that, decoy APIs, which will help you actually figure out what the anomalous behavior is, like the good traffic, the bad traffic, right? So look at everything because that's going to help you at a per API basis. You want to look at the usage pattern for every API, okay? And that's going to be different. So look at it, look at the possibilities of having AI, but if you're relatively young in as a company with an API enabled strategy, yeah, it's not the best time to invest completely, but it, it should be there in the background. APIs are not user-centric. Okay, so we always hear this word UX uh, with our end users, but when it comes to our developers, we, that, that's, that's not spoken much. Okay, so whenever I talk to um, any of, even my team or, you know, any of our developers, you know, there's, there's, that thinking is not there. Um, as to you know, how do we uh, ensure that they have the best experience? And that doesn't mean that you've got to invest time and resources and money and all that, but you can do it low cost too. So when you are building, try to have, you have your own POC, you write your own client and you test it out. If you're doing it internally for another team, do not give them the documentation. Okay, See them actually write the client, maybe just do some bit of usability testing. That's a good test to do at a low cost within the company. That's not going to scale once you start opening that up to even various other teams internal to the company. And it's totally a different game when it comes to you know working with external Windows slash partners. Okay. So that's when you will start figuring out whether you have sufficient budget and money to invest. And then you can start looking at you know various ways in which you can collaboratively design with them. You can then start looking at having a particular DX team. You can start looking at having account managers to handle all that collaboration, right? But as an engineering team, as a product team, you've got to ensure that the way you work with them, ensure that you prototype, test it out, validate, keep that going, and keep 
that doing it in an iterative fashion, right? Because they need to know that they are being thought about. Bringing the tools only once you've got past the stage, right? So that's when you've got to think about API portals and explorers and all the other tools. I'm just watching my clock to see if I need to rush. So the next one is um, APIs are cruddy. Okay, this is for most of um, the engineers whom I worked with who are starting out in the um, API world for the first time. They often think of only um, REST. And so the obvious question is let's look at only CRUD. But I think the API arena today is very different, right? So CRUD is a good way with a basic set of operations, but uh, it's it's gone beyond that, right? So now we're looking at event based where you have like a published pub sub model, right? You're looking at uh, GraphQL, you're looking at gRPC when you are talking about performance, right? Or you want a subset of um, uh, a subset that's when you're looking at uh, GraphQL as async. You are looking at you know devices here like Fitbit. It's completely uh, different. Uh, you'll be looking at device APIs. So um, have that. Um, change that our REST mindset because we were thinking that REST would replace SOAP, but that's not the case. REST still goes on, right? At the same, at the same way, um, you've got to also think as much as gRPC and GraphQL might be, with, might be uh, the best today, we just don't know. There are various different use cases and they will continue to exist and there might be new ones too. So do not have a fixed mindset explore various different options because each one will have a different use case and that there, there could be different um, protocols and methods that you will need to use. APIs are black boxes. Um, we often know we do not expose this whole functionality to our partners or vendors and that's, that's, that's good. But when it comes to actually um, you know, helping them out when there is a problem, you need to ensure that you have sufficient logging and sufficient information that you've gathered. For various reasons, if in a compliance industry where I worked previously, everything had to be audited. In that case, we need, we have to have all the information, we have to have all the data, right? And when it comes to debugging, you need to be um, conscious that you need to help your developer. How do we do that? To give you an example, most often, my team used to have like fixed 5xx errors, right? Be more cautious and conscious about the response codes that you will use, right? Don't default it to a 500 or any of those, right? You need to understand that every code has a particular response and you need to help. Those are the ways in which you can be more developer uh, friendly. And uh, various different, uh, use, use up a lot of the different other tools that you have in terms of monitoring, as well as when it comes to documentation, as I mentioned earlier, on, low cost is good, but ultimately, Consider the documentation as your UI. When you get to that stage, your documents, developer documents have to be really perfect. And that's where the DX slash UX will come in. And finally, um, APIs cannot be hacked. We often think, and I've seen this happen in, the, uh, in a lot of places, OAuth and TLS more than enough? No, uh, we've got a lot of compliance requirements like uh, talk to and everything else at data residency there are so many so many topics that we can talk about right so almost if you look at the osi uh, model practically every layer is you might want to go and check what you can do um, in each of the layers the physical layer when you're talking about data right the security layer what can you do right look at all the possible layers and i should also mention that when you look at the gartner report they always say that the security team is involved in the last stage, and um, that's not good. If you have access to a security team, please use them in when you kick off work. If you do not have one, please ensure that it is a key item in your checklist and get your engineers, or if you are, have uh, the security expertise as well, please wear that security hat on because you've got to have that thinking. Trust no one, trust not your partner as much as you might have a uh, relation, uh, strategic partnership with them, you cannot take things for granted. And I'd like to end with that. Sorry, the volume is not there, but um, that's all about the API stage and from uh, signing off from the, the uh, Tomcat. Thank you. Thank you. And always thank you for cats, dogs, et cetera. We need more of them in our online <laughs> life. Thank you for that talk, Rosemary. Um, 
One thing I was thinking about was you talked about the anti-pattern that AI and APIs are not complementary. And yeah. you talked about ways that API can leverage AI, but are there ways that APIs are driving AI and helping people use? Um, that is true. I think a lot. Um, I must tell that I also have a personal interest in AI and I'm studying it myself. So a lot of the groundwork that we are doing um, in the AI field, there is a dependency on artificial intelligence. You're right. So it's like a two way, right? Mm -hmm. But the other way, the pattern is, um, is very different. The scene is very different. As much as AI is making use of APIs, we in the API scene do not seem to be leveraging off, you know, the capabilities that are there in the, mm -hmm. in AI. Okay, so that's, that's something which is relatively new. Um, and I don't think a lot of companies actually invest in machine learning as much as we have a lot of data scientists around uh, with the ecosystem teams, there's not much. But um, it's, it's lovely to see that uh, with, uh, in the AI space, that, that there are a lot of APIs that you're using practically all your libraries today uh, exist only because we have this concept of APIs. Right? So it, it's awesome to see, but I would love to see companies uh, have API enabled strategies, which also include AI. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about an anti pattern about how APIs are often an afterthought, um, yes. Yes. which is true. It happens. Um, yes. But what is the first steps if that that is how it is? What are the first steps to be more data driven and to squish APIs back towards being first class citizens? So. Um, Data driven is definitely that's that's a good one though. Data driven is definitely something that you need to have at the top of your mind. But um, what I would have often seen in most product people, and I think to myself as well, uh, you're rushing to get something done where you aren't even you're starting to look at solutions, right? We start solutionizing without actually looking at the problem, and that's that's not only with APIs, but I think as a API product person, all the more you've got to be spending more time in the problem space to understand how you can, uh, to understand how, what the problem is and then leave it to your engineering team to figure out whether API is a solution or not. But when you're looking at, you know, um, having API strategies where you're building these partnerships and relying on somebody else to fulfill those capabilities, which as a company, you do not want to spend your time and money. That's when you've got to look at an API enabled strategy that would help you actually fix the problem of it not being a um, afterthought or a technical solution. Absolutely, yeah. But some companies are going to make it an afterthought anyway, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, you're never going to have it uh, perfect, right? We don't be in anything. We don't live in a perfect world, right? You're, but you've got to be conscious about it because there might come a time where everything is going to be a platform, and you are going to be the last in the race. So I think step one would be to be conscious about it. And I would say that Atlassian is, would you identify it as an API first company or? Too soon for me to say um, anything. I must, I should tell you that it's only three weeks since I am with Congratulations. <laughs> so I, w I wouldn't comment on that, but I think prior to that, if you ask me, I worked with Zero and Zero was, uh, we had a huge um, ecosystem there as well. Um, I don't know whether we'd call ourselves API first companies, but I think we are uh, maturing in that space and uh, we are very consciously taking that step to get there. Absolutely. And I think any organization that's so developer centric and providing a lot of tools for developers and tech broader digitally minded teams everywhere will probably have more of an API documentation and True. API first strategy than most. Yes. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And I hope you have a great day and you enjoy the rest of the conference. Yes. Thank you so much for having me and thanks to everyone who patiently listened to the And yes. if any, if anyone has any questions for you, how do they connect with you? What's the uh, best way? You can, uh, you you are seeing my slide at the moment. You can contact me on LinkedIn. Just look me up okay. as Missia and I should be there. I'll be in the chat room so I can also drop my link in there and I can hang Perfect. around for a bit if you have any questions.
Thank you so much. And you have a great day. Thank you. Yeah. 